Hear the word of the Lord from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 11. Concerning the times and season, brothers, you don't need me to write to you. For you yourselves accurately know that the day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night. When they're saying peace and security, then sudden destruction overtakes them, as labor pains in a pregnant woman, and they shall in no way escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that the day should catch you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We don't belong to the night nor to darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as the rest, but let us be wakeful and sober. For those who sleep, sleep by night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But we, since we belong to the day, should be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of salvation's hope. For God didn't destine us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, in order that, whether we're awake or asleep, we might live together with him. Therefore, exhort one another and build each other up one-on-one, -on -one, just as you're doing. God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God, God. You may be seated. Uh, there's an old kind of trade secret among preachers. Uh, you know, we keep track of what topics will draw crowds. And, um, you know, the, the word on the street is that there's three topics you can preach on if you want to make sure that you've got a crowd. You can preach on sex, you can preach on the end times, and you can preach on will there be sex in the end times. <laughs> Those three, you're guaranteed a, an audience. Uh, this, the religious mania over imagining and predicting the future is something that it's very well known today. I mean, we have t TV shows that have come out of some popular conceptions. And evidently some in Paul's churches would have understood that attraction. But this impulse that Paul kind of puts his finger on isn't unique either to religious groups or to any particular age. Uh, instead, it's something very basically human. Uh, we're wired to make sense of things, to, to assign significance uh, to life events in terms of how they fit into a larger picture that includes what we think is coming next, what we think of the future. Actions take on a special import when we see them as flowing into some distinct future. And if they seem disconnected from what we imagine to come next, well, we've got a slang phrase for something pointless and futile, don't we? We say, there's no future in that. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, if you look at aspiring movements of all types, uh, they want to hear themselves spoken of as, you know, the wave of the future. Um, in a contest of ideas, groups will claim that, that history will show that we're right. In other words, future societies will agree with us. Um, we're told that we've got to keep up with the times. But what's all this language about? What's behind that? There's something very basic in human experience. And that's this. What, what something is, very often we can only understand in terms of what comes later. I'll give you super basic, kind of painfully basic um, example. If I were to walk through the door and utter just one word, say the word water, you wouldn't know what that meant. You wouldn't know, is this a verb, is this a noun? Am I asking for a glass, or am I telling you to do something to the garden, right? Uh, it's only in terms of the whole sentence that we kind of know what that word on the front end is about. Likewise in life, very rarely do we see the import of any one event uh, at the time it happens. When you first meet someone, think back to when you met somebody who became very, very significant in your life. There's no way you could have known that when you first met. Uh, in this also, uh, you know, in classes, we're at a school, um, this provokes, this instinct provokes the most repeated question in any classroom. Okay? What's that question? Will this be on the test, right? And the answer is, it may, it may not be, but you're going to wrestle with this in life. 
right? The significance of what's happening now can only really be made sense of in terms of what comes next. We, as human beings, we need hindsight, but we have to live forward. <laughs> and so we imagine, and we try to live in to what we expect to come next. It's true of human experience in general, and it's true of life as a follower of Jesus. In order to answer that question, what should I do? How should I live now? We have to answer that in light of what we think is coming. And so God, Paul tells us, invites us to live into a future that's assured by Him and is very, very different from what the world around us imagines. Pagan society, uh, human culture apart from God, has a real knack for pursuing grand visions of well-being that then suddenly turn into destruction. <laughs> uh, peace, security, you hear it ring, and then the celebrations start, and very soon after, everything falls apart. It's happened enough that really the only shocker is that human beings don't recognize it more quickly. All right. uh, let me just give you an example of the sort of attitude that Paul's addressing. And this is something that's, uh, I think, constitutive of an American mentality as well. Uh, 53 years ago, John F. Kennedy stood before a group of young men uh, graduating from American University, and he gave an address about peace. And in that, he said this. He said, let us examine our attitude towards peace itself. Too many think it's impossible, but that's a dangerous, defeatist belief. It leads to the conclusion that mankind is doomed, that we're gripped by forces we cannot control. He says, we need not accept that view. Our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man. Now, perhaps I can just interject here. Um, there's a few missing premises <laughs> needed to make that syllogism work. And I'm not sure if you could get enough in there to make it work. Uh, but he goes on, he says, and man can be as big as he wants. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. Man's reason and spirit have often solved the seemingly unsolvable, and we believe that they can do it again. Right. Just from a historical perspective, it seems that little else has been done in secular society apart from systematically pursuing what some notable intellectuals of whatever few generations are past imagined as a sure recipe for peace and security. But it seems that an unbiased view would also note that the predictive capacities of our most luminous minds have been, well, they've had an abysmally poor track record. Right? Those who were reputed to really know in the 19th century made lots of predictions about the 20th. Technological advance, the end of scarcity, classless societies, all sorts of predictions. Nobody predicted that over 262 million people would be killed by their own governments. I don't know about you, but that strikes me as kind of an oversight for those who really know. Um, we had a war to end all wars, and there's been very little but war since. In our own day, one of the things that is being pursued is the safety of every individual. And that safety is now interpreted as protection against hearing ideas they don't want to process. Safety against being challenged in assumptions. And it's currently leading to large-scale attempts to extinguish dissent and to muzzle Frank's breach. Now, I bring these patterns to the surface for this reason. Uh, Paul has a word for the source of all this, for this kind of myopic self-reliance that ultimately leads to self-destruction. Paul calls that darkness. Darkness. Now, in our passage, he assumes and he utilizes metaphors that in letters to unfamiliar churches, uh, he explains more fully. And so, uh, if you think through 
what he writes to the Romans in chapter 1, 18 and following, especially verse 21. And taking Ephesians as a cyclical letter, what he writes in chapter 4, again, uh, verses 17 and following, what he does is he describes in both these contexts a kind of willful ignorance of God, this decision to push God out of mind and to pretend that we kind of belong in his place running things. And his word for that, willful ignorance, is darkness and futility. Right? When we push God out of mind, when we enter into this darkness, Paul also explains in those sections that the immediate result is self-delusion. Right? So in Romans 1, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Man can be as big as he wants. And we become deluded about God. We pretend he's not competent, really, to run things. And we turn him into the image of creeping things and human beings. Darkness, darkness then leads to an unraveling of human life, of moral order. And Paul describes that in these contexts as well. And you get to the end of that section in Romans 1, and he describes how those who perpetrate vice actively congratulate each other in their perversions. And so in our text, Paul picks up on this same imagery that he probably had used while among them. And he points out another aspect of this willful blindness to God, this darkness. Um, and that's intoxication. Intoxication. There's a, a heady exhilaration, isn't there, in pretending that we're in control, that there's no human problem without a human solution. It's intoxicating. We feel taller, we feel stronger, we feel a little bit better looking, as long as we imagine that. Uh, but the whole drift of this way of thought uh, lulls us to sleep. And having lulled us to sleep, we wake to find sudden destruction. We find the society we build around it falling apart. There's no future in it, quite literally. And so what humans need is light. If darkness is the problem, this willful ignorance of God, light is a cheerful, easy acceptance of God as God and ourselves in our smallness as creatures under him. Right. In the light, having made peace with God, we can just joyfully embrace our smallness as creatures, the particular place we've been assigned, the task before us. And the Thessalonians, Paul says, are those who have made this turn. They've turned from idols to serve a living God, to acknowledge a God who's active in the world around us. Um, who doesn't sit on a shelf, but enters in and makes things happen. And hence, they should understand themselves now to be sons of light, sons of day. To be a son of, a light, of the light, son of day, is to possess light's character. Right. And here's the thing about light. Um, you may have noticed this. Light doesn't show you what you want to see. It just shows you what's there. And because of that, it can be very uncomfortable <laughs> for some people. But when we take on the character of those for whom God being over all is a welcome, happy thought, the result is we begin to see things as they really are. Right. Sobriety a clear-eyed wakefulness becomes possible for us. We can, not, we can acknowledge there's no human solutions to many of our human problems. And we can do that without dipping into despair, without throwing up our hands in defeat, because we know that human history ultimately is not a human project. Um, it's God's project. He's working in this world, and He is bringing us toward the day. And just as we once pushed God from our minds to pretend ourselves great, now we can welcome God as our guide, as the primary agent in the world, because He is indeed the living God. And in our littleness, 
God can now use us. We don't need to be as big as we want. <laughs> Instead, we can trust in a big loving God to shield us. We can, we'll find that the expectation of that well-being, that salvation that God brings, will protect our head, keep us clear. <laughs> and there's good news for this approach to life. There's a future in it. Uh, because the day really is coming, that moment when, at Christ's return, uh, God, as it were, sheds light on things. And we don't know the time when that will happen, but we do know with accuracy that it will come, that Christ will return. And on that day, when, uh, when light is the order, even our most cherished illusions won't stand. No protestation, no ideological spin will be sufficient to distort our view on that day. God's presence will be too obvious, be too strong, too good, too beautiful for us to cling to the lies by which we darkened ourselves. Brothers and sisters, we can live now in view of that day. That's what Paul's calling us to. We can take into our character the nature of life. We can live in all details now as if all will be seen. Because it will. By grace, we can live a life without deceit, welcoming truth, even when it stings. By grace, we can live a life without bluster, just relaxing into our smallness in confidence that God's way will flourish and uh, the outcome of our life will be as big as what God does through it, not what we make ourselves to be. We can live by grace a life without fear of death and reprisal, knowing that Christ died for us so that we could live together with Him. About the same time that, that JFK uh, encouraged this group of young people to believe in themselves and that they could be as big as they wanted. There was another young man on the other side of the globe speaking to a group of young people as well. He too saw the political power and he understood the ideology of the communists. He understood it because they occupied his country. Uh, Karol Wojtyla in Poland the man who 30 years later would become Pope John Paul II uh, was just a young priest in the country parish at this point. He had finished his studies and was serving. And the communists had a strategy in his country in order to promote peace and security, that classless society, they found that they needed to detach young people from family ties. It was the best way to be able to absorb them into the state. And the quickest way to confuse, to break up family ties, was to confuse lineage. And so they took on a, a thoughtful, diabolical strategy. They began sponsoring youth camps. And they would pay for teens to go out to these, and then they would encourage them to experiment sexually. Okay. And the point was, you know, who knows who kids, whose kid that is? And so, who does it belong to? Well, the state, just like everybody else. In the midst of this, they also were cracking down on churches, and so ministers were forbidden to conduct any kind of religious service outside of church buildings. And of course, anybody who entered those church buildings would be monitored. And so, things were tightening up. And so, what Carol did was uh, he dispensed with his priestly garb. He took to civvies <laughs> and he began forming youth clubs. And he went out and spent time with young people. He played soccer with them. He took them on camping trips. He taught them how to pray in settings that didn't have arch ceilings. And he gave very clear teaching about God's approach to moral life. Now this moral and spiritual infusion of life, of light, didn't go unnoticed in his circumstances. It, it secured, it, it brought 
enough young people that some communists started taking notice and so they began to rough up the young people who were caught around and they would corner them and intimidate them. And so on this day, uh, Carol Wojtyla stood before a group of young people following one of these bruisings and he gave his own advice. His speech was shorter and I find it a bit saner. He said, don't worry. Don't worry about them. Carry on faithfully. If we'll live after the Lord's way, in time, they'll finish themselves off. And so it came to pass. So it came to pass. I don't know what happens tomorrow in our world. What the next several years may hold. But I do know this. The day is coming. And you and I can live as sons of life, children of God. May it be so.